Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Infosys Earnings Call for Q2 FY24. Joining us here on this call is CEO and MD Mr. Salil Parekh, CFO Mr. Nilanjan Roy, and other members of the leadership team. We'll start the call with some remarks on the performance of the company for Q2, followed by comments from Salil and Nilanjan, subsequent to which we'll open up the call for questions. Kindly note that anything we say with reference to our outlook for the future is a forward-looking statement, which must be read in conjunction with the risks that the company faces. A full statement estimation of these risks is available in the filings with the SEC, which can be found on www.sec.gov. I would now like to pass it on to Salil. Uh, thanks, Sandeep. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone on the call. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've had a strong quarter in Q2. Our growth was 2.3% quarter-on-quarter and 2.5% year-on-year in constant currency. Our operating margin was at 21.2%. Large deals was at the highest ever for us at $7.7 billion, and 48% of this was net new. Our Q2 large deals include four mega deals. It does not include the MOU we signed and announced for $1.5 billion. We see that with our large deal wins in the past two quarters, we are winning market share in the area of cost, efficiency, automation, and AI. This is a testament to our strong position as partner of choice for clients. With a clear focus on client relevance, as the economic environment changed, we rapidly pivoted from delivering transformation projects is also delivering productivity benefits and cost savings at scale. These large and mega deal wins help us to build a strong foundation for our future. We continue to see the overall environment where digital transformation programs and discretionary spends are low and decision making is slow. This is impacting our volumes. The adoption of Topaz, our generative AI capability set, is helping us deliver more value and to increase market share. We're currently working on over 90 generative AI programs. Our work is with proprietary and open source large language models. We continue to make investments in generative AI as we look to help our clients navigate the way forward with deep capability. We've trained 57,000 employees in generative AI. We've announced the launch of our compensation review program for all employees effective November 1. Our margin expansion program is being driven comprehensively across the company. We have five areas of focus, pyramid, automation, critical portfolio, indirect cost, and value, and it has 20 specific tracks within these five areas. We are delighted to welcome Rafael Nadal and Iga Sivatek as our brand ambassadors. We are thrilled to be recognized on Cantor's list of most valuable global brands at number 64. With the continued reduction in digital transformation programs and discretionary spend, and the ramp up of our large and mega deals towards the end of our financial year. We are changing our growth guidance for this financial year to be growth of 1% to 2.5% in constant currency. Our operating margin guidance for the financial year remains unchanged at 20 to 22%. With that, let me hand it over to Nilanjan. Uh, thanks, Salil. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the call. Uh, Q2 revenue growth was 2.5% year-on-year in constant currency. Sequentially, revenues grew by 2.3% in constant currency and 2.2% in dollar terms. While we saw continued softness in underlying volume, revenue for the quarter was supported by stronger growth in the balanced portfolio and improved realizations from one-timers. H1 revenue growth was 3.3% in constant currency terms, and operating margins were at 21%, which is the midpoint of our guidance range. Highlight for Q2 was the large deal TCV of 7.7 billion, of which a sizable 48% was net new. 
Consequently, our H1 large deal TCV is at 10 billion, which has already exceeded the total large deal signing for FY23. I will talk about it in more details later. As announced in the previous quarter, we have launched Project Maximus, which is a margin improvement plan across five pillars and over 20 tracks. This program has been well received across the organization, and we have been able to identify several new opportunities across the pillars. We have also seen some early benefits in some areas like utilization and optimization of overheads. We remain confident that this program will create a more meaningful impact on operating margins in the future. Operating margins for Q2 were 21.2% and increase of 40 BPS sequentially, bringing H1 margins to 21%. Increase in operating margins sequentially was due to 0.5% from cost optimization benefits, comprising of higher utilization, pricing, etc. 0.3% from revenue one-timers, 0.1% from rupee depreciation, offset by 0.5% increase due to third-party cost, salary-related, and other items. Client metrics remain strong with the number of $50 million client, clients increasing to 80 and $100 million clients at 39 reflecting our strong ability to mine top clients by providing them multiple relevant services. We are rolling out FY24 compensation hikes for employees effective November 1st. Headcount at the end of the quarter stood at 328,000 employees, a decline of 2.2% from the previous quarter. Our focus on improving operating efficiencies has resulted in an improvement of utilization, excluding trainees, from 81.1% to 81.8%, which we believe has further room for further optimization. Long LTM attrition for Q2 reduced further to 14.6, while quarterly annualized attrition was flat sequentially, flattish sequentially. Fresh uh, free cash flow for the quarter was robust at 670 million, and the conversion to net profit for Q2 was robust at 89%. Uh, unbilled revenues dropped for the second consecutive quarter, and consequently, this has partly led to an increase in DSO by four days sequentially to 67. Consolidate cash and equivalent to that 4.2 billion at the end of the quarter. The board announced an interim dividend of rupees 18, an increase of 9.1% and compared to last year. EPS grew by 1.7% in dollar terms and 4.6% in rupee terms on a year-on-year -year basis. Yield on cash balances was 6.7% in Q2. ROE was 30.9%, an improvement of over 8% under the current capital allocation policy started in FI20. We had an excellent outcome in our large deal wins thanks to our strong client relationships and the relevance of our service offerings. We signed 21 large deals in Q2, including four mega deals. As mentioned, the total large deal TCV was 7.7 .7 billion with a strong 48% net new. We signed six large deals in retail, five in manufacturing, four in telecom, three in FS, two in life sciences, and one in URS vertical. Region-wise, we signed 12 in America, eight in Europe, and one in ROW. Coming to vertical segment performance, outlook continues to remain uncertain in financial services, sector with slowdown in areas like mortgages, asset management, investment banking, cards, and payment. Q2 growth was impacted by spend reduction in some large clients, which was partly, partially offset by ramp-ups of large deal wins in areas like cost optimization and vendor consolidation. We remain cautiously optimistic about medium-term outlook due to the movement to cloud led by increased need for real-time insights and analytics. Growth challenges in communication sector continue, coupled with increasing OPEX pressures. Risk of inflation, high interest rates, and supply demand imbalances are creating near-term uncertainties. Delays in decision-making continues. Our strong large deal signings and pipeline will help support growth in medium-term. The recent deal with Liberty Global reinstates our positioning as a leader in partnering with clients to provide significant savings as well as innovative ways to transform the landscape. EURS clients are taking a conservative approach to discretionary spend, and the trend is likely to continue through the year. In energy, spending remains cautious due to the economic slowdown with focus on cost takeout and ROI. Utilities, especially in North America, continue to feel the pressure from high interest rates, resulting in delays in capital-intensive programs. European utility players are continuing to make investments on legacy modernization. With the external, while the external environment continues to be volatile, manufacturing sector continued to show double-digit growth year-on-year -year in Q2. Our capabilities in areas like digital transformation, cloud ERP, 
supply chain, smart factory, etc. are resonating well with clients, resulting in benefits with vendor consolidation in turn leading to stronger deal signings. While pressure on discretionary spend continues, there are opportunities in areas like infra, transformation, cost consolidation, etc., which is resulting into stronger pipelines. In the retail segment, budgets continue to remain tight with clients continue to focus on budget consolidation, cost and efficiency. Interest on Gen AI is growing and clients are evaluating our Topaz offerings to modernize the enterprise and refactor, re-engineer, and deploy code. While we had a very strong sequential growth in Q2, the underlying softness in volume and discretionary spends continue. We have revised our revenue growth guidance for FY22 to 1 to 2.5% in constant currency terms. Our deal signing and stocks and pipelines lays a foundation for acceleration and growth beyond FY24. We retain a margin guidance band for the year at 20 to 22%. With that, we can open up the call for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touch on telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Brian Bergen from Coven. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you. So I wanted to just start with the growth guidance reduction, and I'm trying to understand if the reduction is more due to the delay of the large deal ramps versus what you had expected three months ago, or if it's more due to incremental volume cuts and other program efficiencies. Uh, hi, thanks uh, for the question. This is Salil. Uh, I think uh, it's it's a combination of those uh, 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 points. Uh, there's uh, the the way large programs start off. There's delays uh, in in starting them. Uh, there was also as we were signing these deals, the, the cycle was a bit longer in closing them. So that 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 had a bit of slowness, and we are seeing discretionary spend. Uh, which is coming down, uh, and we we saw uh, that that continue, continuing on uh, transformation programs uh, uh, being slow. That con continuing on in this quarter, so it, it was a combination of those points. Okay, appreciate the call. And, and then just on margin, you know, and an understanding you have the wage increment that you've just announced here. Um, but you also have margin tailwind to project maximum. So can you give us some, some color on, on where you're finding comfort within the margin range that you were from to here today? So I know you're roughly at the midpoint you know, through the first half. Do you expect to be above or below that as you go through the second half? Yeah, so like I said, we had a good quarter two, and as I explained in my margin walk, uh, we nearly had a 50 basis point uh, improvement from our project maximus on uh, cost optimization, uh, and that gives us comfort for the rest of the year and that the program is, of course, this is a much longer program, which will take uh, not only into this year, into next year as well. Uh, we also realize that we have, uh, you know, apparent uh, inefficiencies, our utilization is still low, so these will go uh, help us and of course offset uh, the uh, the wage hikes, etc. So we have uh, a good program over the next uh, you know 18 months to see where we end up, and of course our aspirations continue to be that to improve margin from where we are presently. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kavaljit Salucha from Kotak. Please go ahead. Hey, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is uh, that can you quantify the revenue uh, one-timers? And, you know, are these uh, revenue one-timers in third-party items bought for service delivery to clients, or those are separate? Uh, uh, see, that we, in the margin walk, we talked about 30 basis points impact on margin from uh, revenue one-timers, so it's going to be around that figure or slightly more than that. So these are largely will fall through straight to margin. What is the second part, Kamal? 
Okay. Uh, the second part of the question is that uh, uh, can you uh, detail of the verticals to which the mega deals belong? And uh, 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 you know the other question related uh, to uh, uh, the uh, deals is that normally you expect the direction of revenue growth and uh, deal wins uh, to synchronize, whereas actually they are moving in the opposite direction. So what needs to change for uh, the synchronization to happen again? Yeah, so Kamal, we don't give out, you know, which uh, segments the mega deals, uh, you know, are falling under. Uh, the second part was you're saying where will uh, revenue and the large deal announcement synchronize? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they seem to be moving in different directions. I mean, you know, I mean, with a $7.7 billion uh, mega, I mean, you know, large deal win, you would have expected a happier picture on growth outlook, whereas, uh, you know, things seems to have changed there. So uh, uh, what needs to change for the synchronization of growth and uh, how the deal wins and growth to happen? Yeah. Sure. So I think uh, one is, of course, mega deals, as you know, uh, you know, post signing, uh, they have a runway in terms of, firstly, in some cases, they may have rebadging. Uh, so that's a time it takes. Sometimes they have regulatory approval, so you can't even do people transfer. And then, of course, there's a transition period uh, and then, of course, post transition, then, of course, you know, there is a transformation element or a run. So these are all steps in the process. And as you can imagine, being such large deals, these cannot, you know, overnight be, you know, turned on in terms of us taking over the entire landscape, etc. So they have to be planned through uh, entirely. And therefore, you know, it takes a couple of quarters before they start, uh, you know, bleeding uh, into the revenue figures. And like I said, this will set us up well for FY25 uh, fundamentally. And as Salil said, you know, in the near term, uh, in the quarter, there is, of course, the underlying volume sluggishness. Uh, and, of course, we have to, you know, recognize that part as we build enough forecast for this year. Okay, and what's the deal pipeline uh, like after the recent uh, conversion of pipeline into uh, a mega deal? So, you know, how does the pipeline look like? I mean, is it significantly lighter or does it stay remarkably strong? It's a strong pipeline, of course, uh, with 7.7, .7 and I think you can, it can't, you know, uh, be higher than the previous quarter, but it's a very strong pipeline. And, of course, we will continue to have enough in the funnel to, you know, start refilling this. Okay. Just a final question on uh, uh, deals. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the past experience of mega deals and the transition of that into profitability has not been very encouraging. Uh, but uh, if I look at your comments and Salil's comments, all of you have highlighted that uh, your... Uh, Profitability aspiration is to improve your profit. You want to improve your profitability. Now, at the same time, you have those uh, mega deals, uh, you know, as well. So, how does uh, the profitability dynamics uh, play out, uh, uh, you know, especially given the past context? So, Kaval, as you know better than anybody else, you know, when we set out the large deal strategy more than five years back, we were close to about 21% margin. Uh, we have signed probably $50 billion plus of large deals, and today we are, you know, 21, 21.2. So we've not seen any margin erosion because of the large deal strategy, right? We recognize over all these periods and this experience which we have, we will sign on these large deals. Of course, upfront, they will have margin pressures. Uh, and from a portfolio perspective, as you look in the deal tenures, we have our experience to say how we can improve the margin of the deal from day one versus, say, in year five. And in a way, that's the portfolio we are able to rotate, uh, go and get deals. At the same time, uh, with our cost optimization programs, make these deals uh, approach portfolio margins. Uh, and, I mean, like I said, the proof of the pudding is meeting. $50 billion of large deals later, our margins are where they were. Um, okay, sure. Thanks. Sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Moshe Katti from Wetbush Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, and congrats on very strong TCB bookings for the quarter. Um, so if, if we're trying to kind of figure out the conversion pace of some of those large deals that, um, I mean, I guess at this point it seems that we haven't seen a lot of that conversion happen, but when do we start? seeing that reflected in better top line growth. Um, is the March quarter of next year is the kind of could be the, the, the quarter where we could actually see better costs for top line growth because of those conversions? Is that the right way of looking at it? 
Yeah, so there are a number of deals in this pipeline. Some uh, will start in Q4. Uh, some which we signed last uh, quarter have already started coming a bit of that into Q3. So it is, it's is—it's is not like one you know, one day we suddenly have you know, these 21 deals, which of course have rebid inside. Uh, so they are phased, you know, and in terms of even ramp-ups, you will see it's not that, you know, the run, you hit the run rate, you know, on the day of the revenue booking, right? Some of them take a longer period. So it's a combination of all that. Okay. And do we, and these are, just to be clear, these are deals that are funded with the calendar 23 budgets. You don't need calendar 24 budget to continue funding these deals. Is that the right way of looking at it as well? Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I could, this study, I couldn't hear, hear that, uh, Moshe. Yes. So the deals that you've won this year are funded with calendar 23 budgets. I just want to confirm that, i.e., you don't really need the approval of calendar 24 budgets to continue funding these deals. Is that the right way of looking at it? Yeah, so it's a, you know, they are already come out of existing budget, but you know, many of these are actually cost takeout programs in this environment, right? Then the consolidation cost takeout. So actually, we are giving money back in a way to the organization, uh, which is why in a way we are winning these deals, right? Yep, good. And then the final question: Do you have any view? Maybe Sudhir so can talk about that about calendar 24 budget cycle that probably should start maybe by next month. Um, do we feel that the budget cycle is going to be on time? Do you think there's going to be budget delays, which is what happened earlier this year? What, what, what are you seeing at this point based on some of the quant conversations that you're having? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this is Salim. The, the, the way we are seeing the client conversations today, uh, we, we don't see a change that's come about. There's a lot of constraints with clients, whether it's some transformation programs uh, or discretionary projects, which are uh, significantly reduced uh, or slowed down. So that thinking is continuing on. Uh, as you pointed out, over the next few weeks, we will get uh, a better sense uh, if that's changing, uh, either uh, uh, improving or not for the following year. But at this stage, that, that's the mindset we are seeing. And there's that attention on cost and efficiency, uh, which also continues uh, uh, as we are seeing the discussion. So the conversations that we've been having over the last few months is, is the same tone we see as they go into the end of, of the year for next year's budgeting. We, we don't see a change in that at this stage. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kumar Rakesh from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question, Salim, uh, was... Kumar, may I request to speak up a bit? Your audio is a little low. Yeah, is this better now? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so, Salim, my first question was around the volume performance during the quarter. You did talk about that it is under pressure, and last quarter also you had talked about it. So, during the quarter, how the volume performance you saw, saw through the quarter, was it further deteriorating since where we saw last quarter? And is your guidance implying that there would be further deterioration outside of the seasonality in the coming two quarters? So, the, the volume specifics, uh, I, I didn't share. I, I mentioned that there was uh, continued constraints or pressure on that. Uh, what, what is happening, uh, uh, if you step back a little bit, is there's impact on, on revenue, which is from slowing or stopping of discretionary work uh, and or the transformation programs. And then we, we have, on the other hand, uh, with the large and mega deals, uh, some of those starting off, that giving us uh, a benefit on the revenue side. So there we saw the volume constraint from the first first part of that uh, in this quarter. In the coming quarters, uh, you, you know that well, uh, we will have in Q3 the usual uh, seasonal impact with the end of the calendar year, uh, holidays, and so on. Uh, and typically for us, uh, for Infosys, 
Q3 and Q4 are softer quarters in any case. We, we anticipate that. We don't have a view which is different from that. That's how we are looking at it going in. But these things uh, are, are uh, changing as we go through each quarter. So we were fortunate. We delivered a very strong quarter. Uh, but we are just, as we look out, we can see the pressures with the clients. Uh, and that's, that's what gives us uh, the reason to be watchful on both those sides. Thanks for that. Uh, my second question was during the press conference, you did talk about that Infosys is working on proprietary large language models. So a clarification is, are these models that you're working on Infosys own or these are for clients uh, or your uh, ecosystem partners and what kind of models, use cases and data set you're using for them? So there, uh, what I was referring to was proprietary models from our partners. So we are not developing a, a large language model of our own. We are working, as you know, again, there are a large number of these models which are already in the market. Some of them are proprietary and some of them are open source. We are working with both types of those models. Typically, we are working in what's called the, the narrow transformer approach, which, which really we start to see data sets which are a little bit more uh, enterprise focused, uh, which allow enterprise, a large client to take advantage of that data set for their own uh, activity. Uh, and the applications, again, you, you, you've probably seen that. We are seeing applications on, of course, software development, on text, on voice, on video. Uh, so we are seeing uh, applications today on all of these areas, actually working on all of these areas. And that is for the clients, and then we're doing some work inside Infosys as well for our own, uh, for our own, own, own activities. Got it. Thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Sandeep Shah from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, the first question is, Niranjan, uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that the mega deal wins and the robust order book signing will help us to accelerate the growth in the beyond FY24. So is it fair to say most of the deal wins of this year will have a solid support in terms of the growth pickup in the FY25? Yeah, I mean, these will translate into revenue one day. So, like I said, they will start in FI25 and like somebody else answered, of course, not like on one sudden day they all start together. So, they will have a run up. But absolutely, they are. The, the, some of them will start even sooner in FI24 towards the five end. Sandeep, is the question answered? Thank you. We move to the next question. That is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I had two questions. So one is on uh, discretionary spends. Um, uh, as yesterday, I think uh, um, uh, your peer had mentioned that uh, uh, they don't think the discretionary spends uh, recover even in 2024. Um, this wanted your thoughts on uh, how are you uh, thinking about this overall. Um, and uh, in the context of this, uh, well, we have seen very strong uh, deal wins uh, this time around. And obviously, those are deals uh, that would have been uh, 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 under the hood for maybe uh, the last 12 months, uh, which have all closed. Uh, when you look at it going forward, uh, do you think that deal activity per se uh, uh, could sort of uh, slow down? Is there a risk there? Uh, or if you could give some context in terms of pipelines versus how it was uh, before these deals closed and how is it today? Uh, is there a lot of replenishment that needs to be done to reach back the same level? Uh, yeah, that's the uh, first question. 
So on the <clears throat> uh, on the first part, uh, we, we don't have a view on uh, financial year 24 uh, in terms of uh, volume and so on. What, what we are sharing today is uh, what, what we are see, what we've seen, for example, in Q2, uh, and what we uh, observe from that, uh, keeping in mind some of the seasonality of this coming quarter uh, and the end of our financial year. On the pipeline or deal activity, uh, as the London was sharing, we see a good pipeline. Of course, the deals we have closed have come off uh, of the pipe, come out of the pipeline, but it's still a good pipeline for us. There's a lot of interest from clients in cost and efficiency and automation, which is where many of these large and mega deals have come in. There's a good interest in consolidation, which is where uh, some of those deals have come in. Uh, and we continue to gain market share in that, so we feel good about it. And there is that continuing interest in that type of work. Sure. Uh, the second question was uh, the underlying assumption on the guidance, uh, if I understand right, is that the revenue accretion from these large deals will be very minuscule, uh, this year, and you have uh, headwinds on the discretionary side. Uh, the bigger uh, accretion should really happen maybe next year. So this year is very minuscule. That, that's a very fair assumption. Yeah, so I have I'm constantly wondering cases. Yeah, the definition of minuscule can be quite different, but yes, I mean, it's more largely in FY25, absolutely. Yeah, so I meant on a quarterly run rate basis, would it be minuscule uh, of that coming into the revenue versus what you originally thought? Uh, that that was the context. Yep. Sure, fair enough. Uh, and lastly, uh, in terms of the headwinds on discretionary, uh, which verticals really stand out in terms of where you're seeing the maximum pressure? Uh, that's the last uh, question. Thank you. Yeah, I think if we mentioned the three verticals, uh, I think you can see it both sequentially. You can see it year on year. You can see it with the peer group. It is financial services, it's mortgage, it's asset management, it's parts of retail, it's communication. And I don't think we are any different from, you know, any of our peers. I think everybody's calling out these three verticals as being soft. Sure, fair enough. Uh, thank you so much and all the very best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vibor Singhal from the Vama Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, so, uh, just two questions from my side. Uh, we started the year with the guidance of 4 to 7 percent for FI24, and uh, we have basically downgraded the guidance second time this time around. So, just, I mean, in the last call, this call, we had mentioned that uh, maybe in the first guidance, uh, there were some assumptions built which did not play out, and we were we had a fair bit of conservatism built into the uh, one to three point five percent guidance which we had given last time. So just want to understand that uh, I mean we have been winning good deals uh, all along, especially in this quarter. Uh, and as you mentioned, that one of some of the deals are taking time. So if, what has changed from the time that we gave the first uh, guidance to this time in terms of the projects that we have uh, that we are already in the existence? Is that especially part of that which is being put on hold much larger than anticipated? Is there any one single or a couple of large projects which have kind of stopped contributing the amount that we had expected? Anything on that color would be really helpful. Uh, so there, um, there is no one uh, project or one uh, specific uh, uh, client uh, that, that is where this is coming from. I think as we as we look at uh, each quarter, uh, we, we look at the combination of uh, the, the two streams, you know, on discretionary work and on uh, digital transformation and other programs. Uh, how that's slowing down, where it's slowing down, what, what the volume implications are, and then we look at uh, how uh, the large and mega deals. Are, are coming into uh, the revenue stream. Uh, and that's what's uh, leading us, uh, as we look out, uh, we, we, when we see changes in the discretionary work, uh, or we see 
some slowing down of decision making for closing deals or, or slowing down in the start or ramp up uh, those are the factors that come into play uh, as we look at the revenue uh, outlook uh, and then uh, as we come into this this time of the year especially uh, we look at uh, the, the seasonality in q3 and q4 uh, and how the thinking is uh, in the client buying environment uh, so that, that's really the, the combination of things that we do there's not any one uh, uh, activity which has led led to that change for us got it any specific pockets of weakness which you have seen deteriorate at a much sharper rate than anticipated it could it be maybe vertical wise or maybe a specific uh, domain let's say cloud adoption or any other domain or is it across the board so the the way we see in terms of industries uh, we have a similar sort of uh, view from last quarter uh, the, the ones that we lunged outline within financial services uh, mortgages or, or asset management uh, if you look at high tech telco some some parts of retail so those are the ones we have not seen uh, any sort of dramatic changes in that but th- those are the ones that where we see the impact got it sure great thank you so much for taking my questions and uh, wish you all the best thank you the next question is from the line of ashwin mehta from ambit capital private limited please go ahead yeah thanks for the opportunity uh nidhan just one question in terms of uh, the third party bought out items uh, uh, that seems to have uh, added almost uh, 75 odd million uh, this quarter so do you see this item sustaining or uh, it kind of falls off and is this uh, one of the reasons for your weak guidance yeah so like i said this is sometimes integral to our strategy uh, as well uh, because we are doing large scale transformations and sometimes they have elements of uh, licenses or software hardware inside uh, and therefore uh, i mean our guidance takes into account both volume and any impact of you know any of that kind of uh, the portfolio the non you know uh, headcount portfolio as well okay okay and uh, in terms of wage hikes next quarter what is the impact on margins that you see or the quantum of wage hikes uh, that you are giving out we have rolled it out we cannot uh, you know uh, say what is going to be the impact uh, but it's you know like we said it's affected for the first of november okay uh, fair enough and all the best thank you The next question is from the line of Kaurav Rattaria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. The first one is that uh, does your guidance factor in the current environment remaining similar in the next two quarters, or it kind of uh, you know further deteriorates from here because uh, it's kind of uh, implying a decline sequentially over the next two quarters. So just trying to understand what's the underlying assumption on the current environment. um i think the way we looking at the guidance is you know typically q3 and q4 are seasonally weaker quarters so that that is something we factored in in addition to what i was sharing earlier uh, the slowing of discretionary transformation and uh, with the large and mega deals uh, seeing how the the ramp up uh, will, will look like as it converts Uh, but we've looked at more what, what we see seasonally a uh, weaker uh, q3 and q4 from uh, uh, our uh, historical uh, perspective all right secondly you have closed a couple of mega deals in the last few months now when you look at your large deal pipeline how do you characterize uh, this uh, do you still have uh, mega deals that you are pursuing which can close in the coming months Uh, so there we we've uh, closed uh, four, four of these mega deals uh, that that I referenced earlier uh, we have a good pipeline uh, we we are not 
detailing beyond that the type of deals. Uh, what we see is, you know, the deals that we've closed have come up, but there's a huge appetite with clients for cost and efficiency, and those tend to be larger uh, within even our large deals uh, pipeline. So yes, we will see some of those larger uh, deals going ahead. Got it. Last question uh, to Nilanjan that the project maximums that you talked about, uh, is it fair to say that the full benefit would accrue to the company in fiscal 25 and it just started to kind of trickle into the numbers in recent quarter, but the full benefit will accrue in FI 25? So like I said, there is a very complex program. There are a number of tracks, uh, you know, so there are new ideas as we, you know, uh, see, you know, each quarter. So you will see, uh, you know, impact over, you know, like I said, maybe 18 months uh, of this program and, you know, throughout as we're tracking it every quarter. And like I said, and sometimes you will see a, you know, faster, uh, you know, benefit like utilization, for instance, is a clearly something which is here and now. So you'll see some of that impact even faster, but some of course, take longer to materialize. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Keith from BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. This is Keith Bachman from Bank of Montreal. Uh, the first question Keith, I have sorry is... To interrupt you. Your, your voice is a little bit muffled. Can I request you to use the uh, handset more closer to you? Yes, absolutely. So you've mentioned a few times that discretionary spend or discretionary projects are a reason for revenue guidance and reporting. Can you uh, tell us of what percent of your revenues uh, would you characterize as, as as being sourced from discretionary areas? Is it 30% of total revenues, 40% of total revenues? Any uh, rough estimate you could give us on how much of your revenues are generated from discretionary sources? Yeah, so we don't uh, really give that number out, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in in public domain. So I think uh, that's where we are. Of course, you know, generally we have fixed price projects. We are more committed. The T N N side of the house will have a bit of variability into it, but we don't give the discretionary really. Okay. The 7.7, .7, the second question of the 7.7 .7 large deal TCV, within that number, do the clients have the ability to cancel those contracts? And what is, if it's, yes, what's the cancellation uh, rate been over the last few quarters versus historic norms? See, these are largely signed contracts. So they take time to ramp up. So we have not seen any real uh, cancellation really, you know, they may take longer to ramp up than, you know, originally in Tazad, but there are no cancellations really. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Perfect. And then my last question is, as you think of emphasis in, in TCS and Accenture and other uh, IT services organization are experiencing challenges with growth. So it's, a, it's an industry wide issue it, against that backdrop. When you think about pricing that your clients are willing to accept, have you seen um, any changes in like-for-like -like pricing uh, when you're negotiating with clients for large deals or otherwise? Has that changed at all, or is the like-for-like -like pricing remain fairly steady even in this weak macro backdrop? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think largely it's been stable. Of course, in some quarters, you can see, you know, a few clients are coming back and asking for discounts. But I think overall, even if I look back, it has been, you know, in terms of the annual renewals, et cetera, uh, I think pricing has been more stable, uh, you know, over the last year, two years as a general trend, I would think, in the industry. Of course, deal to deal, they are, it gets competed hard. But overall, I don't see, uh, you know, a deteriorating uh, pricing environment. Okay, that's it for me, Manny. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Yogesh Agarwal from HSBC. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi guys. Uh, just one question on uh, on last bees, which have been extraordinary, almost two three times of your past run rate. Uh, uh, was curious, uh, uh, what is the share of large bees from existing customers versus new? Uh, can you uh, just give some context there? Uh, so there again, uh, uh, we, we share the net new amount, which is 48%, but we don't uh, share what is from new client versus not new client. Okay, so sorry, the reason I'm asking is it's, it's very intriguing that clients are not spending on small discretionary projects, but avoiding such mega contracts. So is it possible since this year, everyone is cautious they are just clubbing a lot of smaller projects and avoiding in larger deals which means next year we will effectively have two years of uh, catch up on discretionary spend um, you know, some of these deals uh, uh, have been publicly uh, announced yeah. these large programs uh, are a combination of Many times a cost or efficiency automation program, and sometimes the programs which take all of that, let's say, the saving that the client uh, is likely to accrue, and and from that fund uh, some transformation programs. So these these don't appear from our, our interactions to be a, a consolidation of sm smaller uh, discretionary work. These are large uh, independent programs, and that, that's why we feel first that in that space, which is today really more active, this cost efficiency space, we, we seem to be gaining market share, uh, and that those, uh, with the way they're being set up and, and what we see, uh, give us a good foundation for our future. Very nice. Thank you so much, Ajit. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivek Geda from SBI Mutual Funds. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, Salim, in fact, uh, just on your comments that you just made, I just wanted to get a sense of the market share gains that you've been talking about uh, currently because of these large yield wins. Could you give us a sense of how these market share gains have been since the past? Are you seeing quite a bit of acceleration out there and how to think about it? Uh, so there, you know, we are seeing more discussions on cost or consolidation. And when you, for example, you have a, a win as we've had over the last few quarters on consolidation of, of uh, partners with a client, there's a significant uh, change that, that that changes the mar market dynamic within within that client and then we put all of these things together between some of the large uh, programs we run on cost efficiency and then on consolidation it looks like we we, we seem to be uh, gaining traction we, we have a very good capability set on automation and, and clients uh, are appreciating that so that that seems to be the reason why we believe uh, or we think that it looks like we're gaining market share in those areas. Uh, but is there a way to think about from a quantif is there to quantify it from the sense that are you seeing that client budgets are actually not increasing while you potentially are uh, or uh, you're potentially are winning more deals versus what your peer sets are? Uh, d difficult for us to say on a on a sort of macro level, uh, but, but I think generally speaking, the clan budgets at least we, we don't see those increasing at that this stage. Got that. Uh, secondly, I also wanted to get a sense of tenure of some of these large deals that you've done. Um, and in the context of uh, how it has been historically, so while there have been, uh, let's see, probably logical to expect that these are long tenure deals. But if you could give us a sense of how ACV growth has been versus the TCV growth. So there, uh, you know, some of them uh, with the disclosures we've done uh, have that information. 
uh, but we don't, uh, uh, generally speaking, share that information for the aggregate, uh, and certainly uh, not vis-a-vis -vis what, what was going on in the past. But for the, the specific uh, ones where we had the disclosures, we, we've shared that information. Uh, got that. Uh, just lastly, from my side, uh, I just wanted to also get a sense on this third party items bought out, which almost increased by $25 million. However, we called out that one time revenue bumper that we got was 30 basis points, uh, which is literally lesser than what we see here. Is that different items and how to think about that? Absolutely, they are different items. Uh, and in a way, in the margin walk, I also talked about the one time having a positive impact and the, uh, you know, the, the in, uh, license sales, et cetera, having a uh, third party cost, having a downward impact on margin. Yes, they are different. Got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I was just also trying to uh, deconstruct uh, this quarter's growth. Uh, it seems to me uh, there is a volume decline, just going by the headcount decline and, and small increase in, uh, in utilization. And, and uh, uh, so uh, is it, uh, you know, uh, the realization which has helped us or, um, or, or uh, you know, some of the one time which, which you mentioned and it has been asked in the previous questions also, or is it that, uh, you know, um, some of the uh, smaller deals, like fifty million, less than $50 million, which we don't disclose, uh, the uptick in those deals or, you know, kind of inflow of those deals has, has kind of uh, dried up uh, significantly, which is uh, basically resulting in mega deals needed to kind of, um, you know, sustain the volume growth. So as I, in my opening remarks, I said that we are continuing to softness in the underlying volume and the revenue for the quarter was supported by stronger growth in the balance portfolio and improved realization from one time Um Okay. Um, so I, my, my question also was, uh, you know, while I know we don't uh, give the, the numbers out, but the contribution of so less than $50 million deals in our uh, revenue contribution or pipeline, how has that changed? Uh, you know, uh, the, the reason I am asking is it seems that without the mega deal or large deal ramping up, uh, there is a sustained pressure on on margins, and and these deals could be you know it, it could be difficult to time when really these deals will ramp up. So in the absence of that, the contribution of smaller deals has that really kind of changed as a proportion of, uh, you know, uh, uh, revenue over the last few quarters. Yeah, so we don't give out this information. Sure, okay. Uh, thank you, and all Thank you. The next question is from the line of Apurva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, Sarul, I had a question on, on the headcount, which uh, uh, how should we really think about that progressing over the next few quarters? It's, it's been down 5% over the past three quarters with utilizations that have been flat. So how should we expect that to play? Yeah, so you have to triangulate across volume, attrition, new hiring, uh, and uh, utilization. I mean, the broad message is that, you know, even with the utilization increase today to 81.8, we still have headroom, uh, you know, uh, to improve the, the utilization further. So that should, uh, you know, give you a sense of things to come. And of course, we can need to monitor overall volumes, et cetera. So there is enough headroom, and this is helping us in margins, like I said at the beginning, right? Uh, this is that uh, margin lever which we can use. Right, Elijah, and, and and secondly, uh, any vertical call out in the one timer in revenue that that, that should refer to earlier? No. Do you have any other question?
Purva, uh, your line is muted, I guess. Do you have any other follow-up questions? So there seems to be no response from the current participants. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be our last question for today. I now hand the conference back to the management for their closing remarks. Thank you, and over to you. Uh, so thanks, everyone. This is Salil. Uh, thank you for all your questions and the interactions. I just want to close on a few points. First, uh, we've had an incredible quarter on large and mega deals, really, uh, with 7.7 .7 billion, the largest we've seen uh, in the company uh, for a quarter. And this gives us a good foundation for the future. Uh, the quarter itself was great in terms of sequential growth uh, and operating margin. Uh, we've got a uh, comprehensive program on margin expansion, which is in place uh, with, with several uh, large components and tracks uh, running across the company. Uh, and we continue to invest in generative AI, where we're making great uh, connects with clients, especially leveraging Topaz. Uh, so th those really are the main points from us. Uh, and thanks, thanks very much again for joining in for the call. Thank you very much, members of the management. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Infosys, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.